Good morning, it's nice to see all of you here. My name is Alder Kellerman, I'm, I'm a PhD student at the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies and in the Department of Anthropology here at Yale. Many of you have received emails from me over the last few months and it's great to see you all here today. Um, so I think without further ado, we'll get started with our first panel of the morning. Um, this panel is on domestication titled Porcine Prehistory. And our three speakers this morning are Dr. Benjamin Arbuckle, who is an assistant professor of anthropology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he directs the Central Anatolian Pastoralism Project. Our second speaker will be Gregor Larson, uh, the director of paleogenomics and the Bioarchaeology Research Network in the School of Archaeology at the University of Oxford. And finally, we'll hear from Dr. Philip Piper, who is an associate professor in archaeology at the Australian National University, Canberra. His research focuses on human-animal interactions throughout prehistory in Southeast Asia. And since this is a, a, a topic about which many of us may not have as deep expertise as we have about other topics, um, we really wanted to encourage people to ask basic foundational questions after their talks. Um, so please join me in welcoming our three speakers and um, looking forward to it. Uh, good morning, everyone. I, we're going to do a quick bait and switch on you, actually. I am not uh, more than six feet tall and very handsome and good looking. That is Ben. <laughs> Uh, so Healy's going to be going second, actually. I'm going to go first, and then it'll be Ben, and then it'll be Phil. We decided to do that because the way that we had discussed it on email was that I would provide more of a kind of a, a theoretical or larger scale, non-regionally specific discussion of kind of the basics of domestication before Ben and Phil got into some more of the regional aspects of, uh, of pigs in Southeast Asia and Southwest Asia. So. Um, I, my understanding, having read the project or the program, was that the final session of this conference uh, has to do with um, human pig intimacy, and I may have taken that a bit too literally, and uh, decided entirely possible, and decided instead to start off in keeping with that theme um, with a discussion about pornography, uh, which on a Saturday morning is maybe not the best idea, but um, I, there is some there is some relevance to to domestication and. First of all, there's this really famous case. When I say really famous, it means most people don't really know it. I certainly didn't know it for a long time. Uh, Jacobellis versus Ohio in 1964. And real Supreme Court case in which uh, the Supreme Court justices were asked to adjudicate on a charge of uh, obscenity. There was a proprietor of a theater in Ohio who'd been showing a film that was uh, racy, to say the least. And there was a lawsuit brought against him to say that he was violating the statutes, which claimed that he was not allowed to show obscene films. And so the Supreme Court then had to watch the film in question and decide whether or not this actually constituted hardcore pornography, um, which I'm sure they were, was not the normal thing that they usually do, and they were probably enjoying some aspect of that. But So Justice Stewart then has this very famous phrase, and it came up, and this applies to just about everything to do with the continuum, where he says, in trying to define what may be indefinable, and this is the obscenity laws, Obscenity laws are constitutionally limited to hardcore pornography. I shall not today attempt to define pornography, and perhaps I could never succeed in doing so, but I know it when I see it, and this film is not. So this was not racy enough for the Supreme Court justices to uh, persecute this gentleman for having shown this film because it wasn't hardcore pornography, it was going to be softer core pornography. Uh, but where is the line between hardcore and softcore pornography, I hear you asking. And I think that's a very good question because when we ask that same question, we, we do the same thing in domestication, where we have a feel for domestication. We know what wild ancestors look like, we know what domesticated animals look like, and therefore we know it when we see it. But trying to figure out what the difference is between them, where along that continuum does a wolf become a dog, is a much more difficult question, and one that Justice Stewart rightly said, one that could, he could probably never succeed in doing so in defining it, which is why I tend to shy away from definitions of domestication in the first place. But so we know when we see a dog, we know when we see a domesticated pig, it looks nothing like a wild boar, at least in many aspects of it. And we know, of course, we, the difference between the two of them. And we know that that is not a wild red jungle fowl. We know that, that is not a wild red jungle fowl. We know that, that is not a red jungle, or wild red jungle fowl. And in all three cases, you would be hard pressed to guess that those animals were even descended from wild red jungle fowl. But domestication has clearly affected the behavior and phenotype of these animals to such a degree that there is enough difference between them that recognizing them as different things is really quite simple. The question then is, where do we draw that line? 
And do we even draw that line? We could draw that line there to say, well, it's on the spectrum of the difference between wild and domestic, that line exists there. Or perhaps somebody else would spill several thousand words in a very high profile journal explaining, no, 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 actually the line is drawn there. And what they're all trying to do is dichotomize what is effectively a continuum that exists within an evolutionary framework. So the other thing that people tend to do is they use this word domestication event. There's a paper coming out in PNAS on Monday which uses this exact phrase by a colleague of mine who frankly should know better. And the reason that I don't like <laughs> domestication event is because it does three separate things. It implies a significant degree of human intentionality in the process of domestication. It makes it sound like domestication is a technological thing, not a biological thing. So we're talking about the inventing of light bulbs or inventing of glass or inventing of pottery and those sorts of things. And that it can be invented, that it can be invented full stop by smart goal-oriented people. You can be sitting on the open Russian plain in the late Pleistocene and spy a population of wolves hunting some caribou and say, you know what? I bet if we go grab one of those puppies, we can bring it back to camp and maybe we can make it have an upturned tail and some floppy ears and hang out with our three-year-old. It's just, this is not happening. This is not how domestication works. And this level of, in, of intentionality, though certainly an aspect of much further portions of the domestication spectrum, at least very early on, is not what this is all about. And I believe that both Ben and Phil are going to speak to this as well. So Mindy Zeter published a paper about three years ago now, which really, I think, helped to define or helped to um, structure the way that we think about domestication. And what she said was that you can get to domestic animal through at least three separate mutually exclusive pathways wherein each animal starts off as a wild animal and finishes as a domestic animal, but the way they get there is very different. So first she defines this thing called anthropophily, um, or so the commensal pathway, which starts with anthrop anthropophily, where the animals are being attracted to a human niche. And in this case, this dogs and cats and rats and mice and pigeons, all these sorts of things are more or less attracted to the kinds of resources that we are providing on the environment, and they're coming to us initially before we're going after them. Then there's the prey pathway, where you have animals that we are actively hunting. And so you start with prey, you move to game management and herd management before you get to captive animal control and intensive breeding. Again, I would argue that this itself is a more of a slippery slope uh, process involving a series of labor traps where people, even when you start hunting goats and sheep and cows, that you are not actually intending ever to domesticate them. You are just trying to manage a wild resource. And then there is the directed pathway where you just skip straight from the wild ancestor into captive animal control and breeding. Uh, cows are, are the prey pathway, and then you got hamsters is the last one. Um, hamsters are quite interesting. My grandmother was born in 1913. She's still alive. And uh, when she was born, there were no hamsters. And it's kind of interesting to think that there are people alive who were born into a hamster-free world when there are millions of hamsters now occupying bedrooms of four-year-olds all over the US and elsewhere. And hamsters were domesticated, I put that in quotes, because they were simply grabbed from uh, the desert in Syria and brought into a lab setting and those that were able to survive in captivity then were under selective pressure in the lab setting and then as pets and everything else. And so, but the reason that was possible is because we already had a, we already knew what domestic animals were and if they didn't survive that process, well then we wouldn't have domestic animals. But if they did, then we can go through this directed, pro uh, directed process. So last year, Dorian Fuller and I did a quick review of the archaeological literature. And in every single case, regardless of where we looked at in the initial part of the world, every first domestic animal that we saw, whether it was South America or East Asia or anywhere else, they were the commensal animals. So commensal animals are always start. Your prey animals are later. And then finally, you've got their directed species. And we had to stop this chart at 500 BC or 500 BP because the number of animals that have followed the directed pathway now so overwhelmed those that followed either of the other two pathways that that significantly colors our perspective of how domestication happens in the first place. But they can only happen once you've got a domestic animal and the initial process is very different than subsequent ones. So I thought I would come back all the way back to pigs. I thought I would tell you a, a story of how a paper that we published 10 years ago was uh, really absolutely 100% completely wrong when thinking about pig domestication. Now initially people have said that there were pigs were domesticated first in the Near East and also simultaneously in East Asia. And we, what we did is we grabbed a whole bunch of mitochondrial sequences from museum specimens of wild boar across the old world distribution of pigs, or wild boar. And what we found was that there was a very tight correlation between the geography of a region where the pigs was found and its mitochondrial signature. So that it was reciprocally monophyletic in such a way that if you told me where a pig was from, I could tell you what genetic signature it had. And if you told me what genetic signature it had, I could tell you with 99% confidence where this thing was from, which is a lovely thing to do. And then we thought, hey, wait, if we can do that, then perhaps if we look at the genetic signature of the domestic pigs across the old world, then if we find a domestic pig with a signature that matches a local wild boar, then that's possibly or probably even an area where pigs were domesticated. So we did that exact thing and we came up with seven different locations. 
where there were local domestic pigs that matched the mitochondrial signature of the wild boar, and those spread across the old world like that. And we went, hey, this is fantastic. This overturns centuries of investigation about pig domestication, and we got really arrogant and nasty, and we went full-on scientific rock star mode. <laughs> and we said the genetic evidence here presented clear proof for multiple centers of domestication across Eurasia. I, I'm, I was a young, ignorant grad student at the time, um, and I'm still upset at my advisors and at the editors of the journal for, being, for using the word proof, which is just insane. My students would never do that now, but we did anyway. Uh, we went even one step further then. We said that our data showed domestication was not as rare as previously thought. And now the question now is not where were pigs domesticated, but rather where were they not domesticated? And we were chuckling to ourselves. We come up with this very pithy, very um, funny line for it. And new scientists picked up the story, and it was all very big and outlandish. And the reason we were... Uh, it was big and outlandish and we were very confident is precisely because it was 100% wrong. Um, and we started figuring this out because what we realized when we went back to the ancient DNA and we started getting signatures from archaeological material going all the way back to six or seven or eight thousand years ago, this star represents the single uh, uh, site, uh, Chinu, where we were able to get a pig signature in eastern Anatolia where there is no question that pigs were originally domesticated. Now whether it was prey pathway or commensal pathway or something in between is, is not yet determined, but at least it looked like the very first pigs had this kind of blue signature. And then when you get into western Turkey, it looks like they all have these yellow signatures. Now there's no evidence for an independent domestication process in the same way that you have it in eastern Turkey. And these pigs then were domestic ones, had these yellow signatures, and we're like, okay, well maybe this is an independent domestication. Maybe it's that when the pigs get there, they start acquiring the mitochondrial signature of the local wild boar population. So it becomes kind of, there's admixture with populations that's very different than the actual domestication. And we should have guessed this because we'd seen it before a few years prior in a paper where in the Neolithic, when you have people first moving into Europe, the red circles in this case are the wild boar and the yellow ones are all the domestic pigs. So people are bringing in a pig from Anatolia into Europe that is, has a very different mitochondrial signature than the local wild boar and they're taking it all the way to Paris a couple thousand kilometers over a few thousand years. And then, soon after 3900 BC, they still have domestic pigs, but all those domestic pigs are now red. So suggesting not an independent domestication process in Europe, but rather a kind of a, a vacuuming, sucking up of the local genetic variation into your domestic population. So that those pigs are simply mating with the local wild boar, and then you're getting the offspring from that, and then it overturns and then completely eradicates the original genetic signature that came in. So nothing to do with an independent process and everything to do simply with admixture. And then we started thinking, well, actually, if you look around the literature, this is a lot more common than people maybe have given credit for. We know that in pigs, in the 19th century, there was the pig improvement program where in Europe, where people were bringing in Asian pigs, Asian domestic pigs, into European stock, such that now all European breeds have at least or approximately 30% Asian uh, DNA. And they were doing that for all kinds of reasons involving the rate of growth, the overall size, in some cases, the number of um, piglets and a whole very uh, slew of other traits that were very favorable to the people who were breeding pigs at the time. And we start looking elsewhere and it's true of a whole range of plants and animals. So uh, in chickens, we know that chickens are primarily descended from the red jungle fowl, but those yellow legs that you see are actually coming from the gray jungle fowl or Gallus sonorati, which is from South Asia. So this is not an independent domestication of sonorati, it's simply that this other wild species contributed some genes into the domestic chickens that were hanging out in South Asia as they were moving through into Western Eurasia. Uh, cows, well, everything in Africa is some combination of taurine and indocene. Taurine, the cows that you're familiar with, indocene, the cows with the hump on their back that you are more, uh, more generally associated with South Asia, but you find a lot of them in Central America and South America as well. And you get all kinds of hybrids. So everything is a certain percentage of those hybrids of either taurine or indocene. So this kind of general process of blending and hoovering up and mixing different things is, is relatively common. Horses, pff, of course, maybe not a surprise that uh, this particular paper a few years ago found that the spread of horse domestication out of Western Eurasia was characterized by high levels of integration from local wild populations. You have your domestic horse, you move to an area where there's wild horses, and then you mate with those wild horses and acquire the genetic material from those wild horses everywhere you go across Western Eurasia. And then you start moving into the, the, the plants and it's exactly the same thing. In fact, apples, the people are using different terminology, but they mean the same thing. In this case, it's bi-directional gene flow between domesticated apple and the European crab apple resulted in the current M. domestica being genetically more closely related to this species than to its central agent progenitor, which means, of course, that it exists exactly like the pigs. Apples domesticated outside of Europe, but when they get to Europe, they start hybridizing with the European apples, and then they end up looking more like European than they did from their original wild ancestors. Grapes, exactly the same story. Domesticated in the Near East, moved into Europe, start hybridizing with the European. In fact, every single plant and animal we started looking at has exactly the same pattern. If you have a domestic 
thing and you move it somewhere where there's something capable of it reproducing with, it will reproduce with that and then it will become sort of a big blended mix of all the genetics. Uh, this one is kind of fun. This is the citrus family. I won't read through this entire thing, but it just gets insane. I've really never known the difference between pomelos and tangerines and oranges and whatever else we call them in regional dialects and things. But um, it's what you end up with is this, this ridiculous um, this paper which basically said everything is a hybrid of everything else and we're only because we have access to the genome level now we can start to figure out what's contributed what to what and now there's possible ghost progenitors and things that we haven't sequenced yet it's just a complete absolute nightmare of a mess but it's a whole lot of fun and you kind of expect it for something that's this closely related so we did some some work recently where we showed can we look at this more quantitatively can we think about admixture as a process that's happening while looking at the correlation between the genetic signature and the geographic signature so uh, I did this about Easter and you can tell because M&Ms usually aren't this color but the, I went with the more pastels because they're kind of easier to see and in this particular case if you think of this as a, a geographic area where you've got these th four different populations of column pigs and in those are the color represents the genetic signature and the region on the map shows where they're from if you look at the correlation between the genetic distance and the geographic distance, in this case, everything is nicely segregated. And so then you can do, uh, the short ones are, are closely genetically related and the further ones away geographically are more uh, genetically related or geographically separated as well. And so you've got an R squared value there of about one. And then the same thing happens when you, um, if you start mixing things, you start moving them around that landscape, that R squared value starts to drop a little bit. So that's less than one. And if everything becomes complete blended mix, where everything's just made and hybridized with everything, so everything is absolutely everywhere, then your R squared, R, R squared value is about zero, and everything is completely blended. And when we look at wild boar, the first number that we get for wild boar is 0 0.7, which is pretty close to one, which is really high, and that you would expect, given what we showed you before about how there is a very tight correlation between the genetics and the geography. But when we look at domestic pigs, it drops all the way down to more than just over 0.2, which is just ridiculously small. So that really suggests strongly that people are moving their domestic pigs across the landscape, hybridizing with the wild boar and with other <clears throat> domestic pigs from other places, and you're getting a, a scenario where your pigs are like your pastel M&Ms and everything is just mixed up all over the place. So that's a huge amount of admixture. Same thing with wolves and dogs. Wolves are reasonably high. Dogs are just about as close to zero as possible because we've been very much more effective at moving dogs around than we have with pigs. There are wild animals where this is happening as well. In fact, everything that people are now doing with genomes makes it sound like this admixture thing is more the rule than the exception. And so you've got butterflies and people are showing this with nice trees where rather than a bifurcating tree, it becomes more of a cloud where everything's swapping genes around. So in the butterflies, you can get really good uh, species that are swapping up to 60% of their genetic material and still retaining their integrity morphologically and behaviorally. Uh, mosquitoes are swapping stuff left, right, and center. Humans are swapping stuff left, right, and center. This is the most recent picture from um, David Reich's lab at Harvard showing that Denisovans, Neanderthals, modern humans, everything, everywhere is just, just shagging perpetually and, and swapping genes like you wouldn't believe. So it's not just our domestic animals. We're not just saying that they're the only ones doing this. We're at it too. So, so what? So I would say the lesson of all of this is that we really need to differentiate between two distinct uses of the word domestication. This gets thrown around in a very simplistic fashion, I feel. And really what we need to do is say, look, there's this first thing, which means an independent initial process of domestication. And that's fine. I'm very happy with the word for that purpose because that's, I think, what we all mean by that. And then there's the second thing, which is subsequent admixture with populations that were not involved in the original domestication itself. That is not domestication. However, it is often interpreted as such, and that was the mistake we made 10 years ago when we looked at patterns of admixture, assumed that it was independent domestication, and thereby claimed that pigs were domesticated seven times, which of course every archaeologist when we said this were like, Gregor, you're insane. We we're like, no, we got genetics, and they're like, you're insane, and now we're like, yes, okay, we're insane. So subsequent admixture is not domestication. In fact, Dorian Fuller and I have come up with this phrase, introgressive capture, which yes, doesn't roll off the tongue very lightly, but it kind of gets the point, which is that what, instead of domesticating something, you are simply capturing the genetics of that wild population or of that other domestic patient when domestic population when you move that new, new area. And I think also that the general underappreciation of this phenomenon, of this admixture, confuses definitions of domestication and biases our interpretation, and I say this as having done so 10 years ago, making it very difficult for us to come up with accurate ways to infer the past from the present. And if you are insisting that every time you see a new signature somewhere, um, that that is an, an independent domestication <clears throat> process, you are almost certainly going to be wrong about that because everything that we've ever seen from wild animals to domestic plants to domestic animals is the same thing. And I think that we, underneath it all, I think we really do have an appreciation for this and we like it because um, there was a, a really interesting uh, philosopher that you may be familiar with, Carl Spackler, uh, from a film just about 30 years ago now, I think, 
um, uh, in Caddyshack, and he has this brilliant phrase, which only occurred to me years after the fact, because uh, I saw this film probably every night in college for four years. Um, and he says, in speaking about a particular grass that he was in charge of on the Bushwood Country Club, he said the grass was a hybrid, and it's a cross of Kentucky bluegrass, featherbed bent, and Northern California sensimia. So getting to this whole point of like the, the grass itself was robust and strong and important because it was a hybrid rather than being something that was less admixed. Uh, of course, the amazing stuff about this is that you can play 36 holes on it in the afternoon, take it home, and just get stoned to the bejesus built that night. <laughs> so I think that we do appreciate admixture uh, in some circumstances anyway, and then if we extend that to our general appreciation of domestication, we'll all be better off. Thank you very much. So I think if there is one or two pressing questions briefly, I could take that, but otherwise we can move relatively speedily on, get to these three guys, and then we can all sit at this, this nice table and, and take some more general questions. So please wait until you have the microphone to ask your question so that it, so that it comes out nicely in the recording. Uh, I just have a quick question. Um, is the admixture intentional? Or are the wild animals coming to the domesticated animals? Are the domesticated animals escaping? Yeah, I, that's a very good question. I think it's both. I think there are certainly times when it is intentional. And uh, there's some really interesting data that Mindy Zeter has that uh, from Western Anatolia, where on a number of archaeological sites, they find an insane amount of neonates. And it almost, one possible hypothesis that I can throw out there is that it almost looks like in all likelihood, you had small populations of people and small populations of pigs. And in that case, you have to be worried about inbreeding depression. And especially when you're going into new areas where perhaps the environment is not quite what it was where the animals were originally domesticated. And it would actually behoove those animals to acquire the traits of the local wild boar, excuse me. So what it almost looks like is that there may have been some relatively early degree of intentionality of mating or grabbing wild um, piglets, bringing them to camp, mating them with your boar, and then keeping those piglets that were still amenable and still had the, the sufficient enough domestication traits. Um, it's, it's speculative at best at the moment, but it seems at least that the intentionality may have gone pretty far back. Now, of course, when we're talking about pigs and hybrids and, and chickens and everything else, it is massively intentional. and We're doing genomic selection on these things. But when does, the, when does that intentionality kick in is, is a really good question. Uh, but certainly, it's also true that uh, the way that people were keeping pigs for thousands of years after domestic, uh, domestication was a more of a very free range model. And if you look at things like donkeys and camels, uh, there are no wild camels anymore, but for a very long time, and donkeys even now will readily interbreed with animals just because they're kind of left to their own devices. And if, if they're left to do their own thing, then sure. In New Guinea as well, there uh, is a relatively common practice of putting a uh, pregnant sow on a stick at the ed edge of the village and waiting for the feral boar to come in and mate with her overnight, and then you bring her in. So there is a degree of intentionality with that as well. So those, a series of different models of ways to do that, but then thinking about how in, how purposefully it's being done is, is uh, a bit of an open question. It's kind of hard to read that strictly through the archaeological record, but it's a great question. Thanks for a terrific presentation. Thank you. Um, can you talk a bit about the implications of uh, in the reduction in the genetic variety of, for example, swine and intensified agriculture, both for um, uh, thinking relative to Bill Murray's uh, comment, mm -hmm. uh, particularly if they replace after catastrophic events, yep. uh, if you're replacing with the same genetic stock as prior to the event? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, most of my stuff tends to be about eight to 10,000 years old. So uh, my commenting on more modern breed practices is, is uh, start to get on thinner ice. Um, my understanding, because I'm working on a, a very large chicken project with this, and we just had someone come and speak about the industrial chicken production as well. And there is certainly an element of a loss of genetic heterogeneity, of genetic variability overall, when you are going for single traits that you're trying mm -hmm. to maximize. But what's also true in all of the domestic, um, uh, domestic animal industries is that they're not just trying to maximize a single trait. And when you start to try and maximize across several different traits, that significantly uh, slows down that process of homogenization, where then you start to get into a, a situation where you have zero variability and then are highly uh, subject to uh, some sort of uh, a virus that comes through or um, an inability to process a particular kind of 
feet or whatever it is. So um, it's, there is certainly uh, a reduction when you are under a very strong selective pressure to try and grow the quick things quickly, to try and make the resistance to various diseases and everything else. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's all doom and gloom and that we're all going to be without the uh, pigs and chickens, or whatever else, in a matter of years. But it's certainly, uh, you know, the industry takes it seriously because they know that if they don't, if we don't have pigs anymore, they're not making any money either. So, but yeah, it's the incentives are not always aligned perfectly. One more quick question. Uh, how could we tell, in terms of evidence, whether the pig was a commensal uh, domesticate uh, or not? What would we be looking for, and why, uh, since uh, rats and pigeons and so on uh, are commensals but didn't become fully domesticated, uh, is that human intentionality that turned one commensal into a domesticate and the other not? That's a good question. Um, seeing that archaeologically is something I think Ben might speak to a bit. And there are, you can be looking at sort of the duration of how long it takes, what the changes are in the bones, what the changes are in the genetics over a very long period of time. Uh, presumably, if it's more of a directed pathway, it's going to be a much shorter period of time than you would see this over. Um, I have a slight issue with this fully domesticated versus partially domesticated. There are populations of rats that are very, very domesticated. Thank you very much. They are um, existing in labs and in four-year-old bedrooms all over the nation, all alongside their hamsters in one corner and a rat in the other. So um, there, are, I think there is a variability across a whole range, uh, and, and pigeon fanciers, there's no reason to think of those as not domesticated. Um, there, um, there are feral populations as well, and there are sort of things maybe in between, but there are certainly members of a lot of different animals that would qualify as a domestic animal based upon any criteria. So I think it's something I've been in a little bit of a uh, silly, um, I don't know, war is too strong a word, but there's some people who claim that cats are not fully domesticated. And I'm like, well, they sleep on your bed and they sleep on your face at night. Like, I mean, like, <laughs> how is that not, anyway. So yeah, so I just, but I have more of an issue with the terminology of us trying to, what criteria would you use to define something as fully domesticated or half domesticated? What units are you using? Like number of hours spent on your face at night is, you know, I think that's, that cats are on the pretty far extreme of that part. So, uh, but it, it is, it's, it's a really good question. Okay, great, thanks. All right, well, good morning. Let's start out by uh, thanking Gabe and the organizers for, um, for inviting me to participate in this, um, uh, in this, in this interesting uh, uh, assortment of, uh, of, of individuals talking about this, this very specific and yet sort of broadly interesting uh, topic. People keep like, raising their eyebrows when I tell them why, why I was headed up to, uh, to New Haven this weekend for a, a conference on, on pigs. Really? You can do that? So it's a, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be here. Uh, so this morning I want to talk about the origins of pig husbandry in the Neolithic Near East, um, one of, if not the earliest, center of pig domestication uh, in the world. I want to start uh, briefly by addressing the issue of domestication, very briefly, since uh, Gregor did a wonderful job with that, as we knew he would. Uh, I want to introduce the archaeological evidence for animal management, and then turn uh, to the archaeological record of Neolithic Southwest Asia, where I do my work. So natural and cultural historians have been addressing the origins of domestic livestock for well over a century. And as a result, there are many different perspectives on what the term domestication means. For my purposes, I want to emphasize a few characteristics of the domestication process, which we'll then attempt to follow in the archaeological record. First, it's a process of increasing interdependence between humans and animals that's characterized by great time depth. So it's a good thing for archaeologists to address. It results from significant human impact on animal behavior, reproduction, mobility, and feeding. It involves intentional human use of animals as opposed to commensalism. And it's the evolutionary process of artificial selection, usually unconsciously applied, which creates biologically unique domesticates. Domestication, as uh, Gregor mentioned, should be seen as a relationship with animals that is not isolated or unique, but rather sits on a continuum of more or less intensive human-animal relationships, all of which we may expect to find in the archaeological record. In addition, the boundaries of domestication are often less than clear. Differentiating between management of wildlife and the management of domestic herds can be difficult, as the boundary between the two can be difficult to assess, as represented by these farmed fallow deer. Taming reflects an intimate relationship between human and animal that can also be difficult to distinguish from domestication. In addition, 
domestication is not a stable state with feralization and, as we've just seen, introgression between wild and domestic animals, a common occurrence. So turning to the archaeological methods used to identify the domestication process, I want to briefly introduce the four lines um, of evidence that I'm going to follow. First, it's expected that the abundance of a taxon at an archaeological site or its increase over time reflects an intensive relationship that may develop into domestication. This is reflected here in this figure showing a shift from economies based on hunting gazelle to herding sheep and goats in Neolithic Israel. Second, the expansion of uh, an animal outside of its natural range is often assumed to be the result of intensive human management and therefore reflecting domestication. Um, as uh, seen here by the importation of large mammals to the island of Cyprus. However, it's also clear that humans have been dispersing both wild and domestic taxa across the globe for millennia. So this line of evidence is often quite difficult to assess. Third, domestic animals exhibit a suite of biological changes known collectively as the domestication syndrome. These include changes in horn shape, coat color, and ear and tail morphology, and have been linked to intensive selection for re reduced aggression required for animals to live in close contact with humans, a process defined by the Soviet geneticist Dmitry Belyev as behavioral selection. One of the most important of these changes for archaeologists is a decrease in body size evident in most domesticates, and certainly in pigs, compared to their wild ancestors. It is important, however, to recognize that size is not a direct reflection of human management, since the earliest managed animals likely maintained a wild phenotype, and domestic phenotypes can sometimes be transferred into wild populations through introgression. Finally, archaeologists also look at evidence for herd management in the form of kill-off patterns to assess domestication. Simply put, human management generally produces more juvenile animals in a faunal assemblage, whereas hunters tend to target adult individuals. So let's now turn to the archaeological evidence from uh, Southwest Asia for the early management of pigs, and then we'll briefly touch on the spread of pigs uh, across the region uh, and beyond. In the Paleolithic, so 50 to 20,000 years ago, mobile hunters in the Near East hunted a wide range of game, including wild boar, uh, but boar were not an important part of early subsistence economies, representing only about 1% of the animal remains at most sites. However, by the end of the Pleistocene, um, evidence from a surprising place, the island of Cyprus, tells us that there were major shifts taking place in the, humid, uh, the human sewage relationship. On Cyprus, which was never attached to the mainland, archaeological sites indicate that pigs were transported to the island as early as 10,000 BC well before the advent of agriculture. Here, pigs represent the primary prey species on the island and were intensively exploited from about 10 to 8,000 BC. Jean-Denis Vigne has argued that these early Cypriot pigs are significantly smaller than their mainland counterparts, but instead of arguing for a pre-Neolithic domestication event, he interprets this as an example of island dwarfism, which is a common um, process uh, seen in, in the ecological literature. This is supported by the very low frequency of juvenile pigs at these early sites, which suggests that boar were released to the island to be hunted with the help of dogs. So if an increasingly intimate relationship with boar was developing on Cyprus, what was happening back in the mainland at the same time? Well, at the site of Gobekli Tepe in southeastern Turkey, we have a large settlement where hunter-gatherers constructed impressive ritual structures. Here, pigs are only a small portion of the economy, and there is no evidence for management. Although boar do play an important role in the iconography of this impressive site, so they were clearly an important part of the cultural landscape. Moving further east, we turn to the site of Halanchemi. Halanchemi is a very important early village site, contemporaneous with the, uh, the early sites on Cyprus. Uh, and here, Richard Redding has made a very well-known argument for the earliest pig management anywhere in the world. This argument is based on the high frequency of pigs at the site, or about 26% of the, of the faunal assemblage, a relatively high frequency of juvenile pigs, and body part profiles which suggest that entire pig carcasses were brought to the settlement. Although it's important to note that this assemblage is currently being reanalyzed and published by Mindy Zeter of the Smithsonian, my take on the evidence is a little bit different uh, from Redding's. 
Based on a recent publication, juvenile pigs are in fact not very well represented at Halanjemi, especially compared to later sites. There is no evidence for any morphological changes associated with domestication, and boar would have lived very close to the settlement, so it's really no surprise that entire carcasses would be present on site. The transportation costs would have been very low. So in short, at the current time, there's really no good evidence at all for pig management at Halanchemi, despite the fact that it usually shows up in the literature as the, as the source of, uh, of, of the earliest domestication of pigs. Moving slightly to the west, the Neolithic site of Chayanu, which Gregor mentioned has, a, has sort of one early um, sort of genetic result, uh, is probably the most important place for documenting early pig domestication. The long occupational sequence of the site provides a window into the process of gradual intensification in the human-pig relationship. The people of Chayanu were certainly pig lovers, with pigs representing half of the animal remains at the site, which is totally remarkable for a Near Eastern economy. In addition, morphological changes as well as kill-off patterns suggest that the first successful experiments with pig management were taking place here. Work by uh, Hitomi Hongo and Richard Meadow has shown that the Chayanu pigs exhibit a gradual decrease in size over time, which begins in earnest in about the mid 9th millennium BC. In addition, the length of third molars decrease over time, reflecting shortening of the snout, characteristic of domesticates. The frequency of enamel defects, markers of biological stress, have been shown to increase over time, suggesting increasing human control over diet and mobility. Finally, kill-off data show an increase in the frequency of juveniles through time, suggesting a gradual increase in, in the intensity of human management over a 2,000-year occupational sequence. Finally, just one more site, uh, I want to move to the Euphrates Basin, uh, to the site of Navalachori, uh, which represents an early Neolithic farming village culturally similar to Chayanu, uh, which Joris Peters has argued as the earliest evidence for domestic sheep, goat, cattle, and pigs together in one place. At Navalachori, which is located in a rather dry uh, environment, um, pigs represent only about 13% of the fauna, so it's quite different from Chayanu. However, Yoris has argued that the Navalachori pigs exhibit a decrease in body size compared to boar from earlier sites in the region, consistent with a small domestic population. In addition, carbon and uh, Nitrogen isotope evidence has been used to suggest human manipulation of the pig diet, possibly feeding animals agricultural byproducts, which represents one of the earliest arguments for the practice of intentional foddering. So to summarize the evidence from the earliest pig management in the Near East, it's clear that between about 12 and 8,000 BC, an increasingly intimate relationship was developing between humans and pigs. Despite a generally low level of interest in sewage across the earliest Neolithic Near East, a few specific communities developed what we might call strong pig cultures, and it's from these, or perhaps just one of them, um, that domestic pigs uh, first developed. Secondly, by the mid-9th millennium BC, control over the movement, feeding, and perhaps breeding of some pigs resulted in the appearance of primitive domestic populations increasingly adapted to living amongst humans. So the archaeological evidence is pretty clear um, that southeastern Turkey uh, was the epicenter of the earliest successful experiments with pig management. Once domestic pigs are present, how quickly do they spread to neighboring regions without traditions of intensive boar hunting? This is the last question, question I'd like to very briefly address. So boom, uh, with this graph, I've mapped out evidence for changes in body size uh, at uh, for pigs from 50 Neolithic sites in Turkey through time. The colors match the regions uh, on the map in the corner. What we see here is a pretty nice picture of decrease in body size over time associated with the long-term process of pig domestication. You can see that the decline in body size first occurs in southeast Turkey, the purple dots, um, where they, we have good evidence for early management. Then as Neolithic communities spread west, the orange, yellow, and green dots, domestic pig body size continues to decline. However, looking at the red data points representing central Anatolian Neolithic sites, we see a different pattern in which small-sized domesticates never appear. Um, to put these data on a map, we can follow the spread of domestic pigs from east to west across Turkey uh, on their way into Europe. However, the process is not a smooth one. 
pig management emerges very early in the Euphrates Basin, but remains isolated there for a long time. Once it does emerge, it moves quickly westward along the coast of southern and western Turkey. Here there's another pause, and it's a full millennium before domestic pigs are brought into northwest Turkey, which is strange because it's just you know, an inch or two on the map. In addition, <laughs> in the central Anatolian Neolithic, domestic pigs were never, ever incorporated into the economy, despite the fact that for 3,000 years they were surrounded by neighbors who were raising pigs. This suggests to me an intentional, long-term, really rather shocking rejection of domestic pigs and pig management. And it turns out that this pattern from the Turkish Neolithic of the lurching and patchy spread of domestic pigs is repeated elsewhere in the Near East. It is the norm rather than the exception. To put this into sort of a cartoony summary, um, at about 9,000 BC, there is no sign of intensive pig management, but we know that wild boar are being uh, captured and released to Cyprus, and this kind of relationship might be happening elsewhere. By the mid-9th millennium, we have the first evidence of long-term pig management in southeastern Turkey, but it's only at one settlement. By 8,000 BC, pig management, possibly including foddering, is still only present in the Euphrates Basin in a few culturally related settlements. By the mid-8th millennium, pig management has spread considerably within the Euphrates Basin, and domestic pigs are being managed on Cyprus, possibly as a result of a reintroduction of domestic animals. Around 7,000, pig management finally takes off and spreads with migrating farmer, hunt, or farmer herders all the way to western Turkey and east to the flanks of the Zagros Mountains at the site of Jarmo. By the mid-7th millennium, the footprint of pig management hasn't changed much and large areas of the Fertile Crescent, including most of Iraq, most of Iran, uh, and the southern Levant, are still without domestic pigs. It is in the early 6th millennium, no longer even the Neolithic period, we're in the next cultural period, that domestic pigs finally began to appear in northwestern Turkey and the southern Levant. And by 5,000, pig management has been more widely incorporated into these economies. However, even in the 5th millennium, more than 3,500 years after the initial domestication of pigs, and by this time pigs are already in Britain and Scandinavia, pig management has still not spread into some of the major regions of the Near East, including central Turkey and most of Iran. So to conclude, I want to emphasize that we still know very little about the earliest transition from hunting to early pig management in the Near East. In the period before the onset of the domestication syndrome, archaeologists are really flying blind. Without the evidence from Cyprus, where boar were clearly transported by people in boats, we wouldn't really have a sense of the sophistication and intimacy um, of hunters' relationships with boar populations. We do, however, know that by the mid-9th millennium, pig management had progressed to the point that a few populations start to show signs of the domestication syndrome. This is what we usually point to as the origins of pig domestication, although it's sort of an arbitrary point. However, it's worth pointing out that the process of domestication must have begun quite a bit earlier than this, and that the biological processes associated with domestication would continue through the three millennia of the Neolithic period, and of course on to the present day. Finally, Although the data from Turkey and elsewhere in the Near East indicate that pig management appears very early in the Neolithic, it did not spread very quickly. And when it did, it was patchy in its uptake and seems to have been emphatically rejected by many communities. This suggests that despite the incredible potential of pigs as sources of animal products, there were major technical, environmental, and perhaps ideological problems that had to be overcome in order to incorporate them into Near Eastern economies and lifeways. Addressing these barriers to early pig management has received almost no archaeological attention, and I think is one of the really interesting ways or, or themes uh, looking forward uh, to address that's really going to help us understand uh, the history of human sewage relationships. So that's a thank you. Yeah, sure. I love this picture, by the way. This is a, a friend of mine took this. This is a, a boar walking across the beach near Izmir in Western Turkey. Right? Um, thanks. I had a question about the um, non-uptake of pig management in those two regions. Yeah. I was wondering, um, because 
I work on Britain and the British Empire in the 19th century, and there are put lots of places where like certain animals are not raised for a lot of the reasons you suggested, which include ideological, yeah. um, environmental, cultural, et cetera, but also because the economy is, you know, there are regional specializations in particular places and there's trading that's going on between them. So I was wondering, um, is it possible to tell if that's part of what's happening in your uh, your case or like how sophisticated are these economies, are people trading specialized products back and forth, yeah. and does that have anything to do with that's a, that's this map? A good, that's a really good question. And I think that the general, I mean, the, so the basic answer is not really sure, because a lot of those animal products, we just don't see in the archaeological record, right? If they're like, if they're skins, if they're meat that's you know removed from, from bones. Um, I think the general assumption is that with these prehistoric economies, they're pretty local. Mm -hmm. um, they're pretty self-sufficient. Uh, and there's not a lot of evidence for that kind of interdependence on a, on a sort of a regional on a regional scale. Certainly, when you get a little bit later, um, you can sort of piece the, piece it together that you're you're, you're getting a much uh, a much more sort of regionally integrated and specialized economy. That, that it's an interesting it's an interesting perspective because really nobody in sort of this, this deep prehistory in the Neolithic is really addressing that at all. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but I, I I think probably. Probably there's not a lot of, uh, of reliance on the on the movement of basic foodstuffs um, around. I mean, for one reason, you know, there's there's no evidence of, uh, of I mean, transportation is, is is difficult, right? It's all it's all human powered. It's all um, you know whatever you can put on your uh, on your back. So there's so there's some basic limitations with uh, with that. And the the general response of those patterns is is for for archaeologists who again in prehistory tend to be ecologically oriented is that it's an environmental <coughs> issue. The Near East is a is it's largely a semi-arid environment. So that's probably one of the, the strongest features affecting where it makes sense to raise water needy pigs. Um, but one of the things I, I, I want to emphasize is I think that's not sort of, I think the cultural component of choice of, of other reasons um, is, is much more interesting and I think probably much more important. Than, and when you look at this pattern, it's just like, why does it take so long for domestic, I mean, domestic pigs? It's like, you know, it's not, that hard to raise pigs, and the, and the benefits are, are, are pretty obvious. Um, but again, to, to come back to your question, I think I think they're mostly localized economies, um, uh, and it's 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 the internal logic of uh, it's probably different in each community as to why they, they do or don't um, incorporate pig management. But it's a, uh, it's a it's a it's a complex choice. Thank you so much for this. Um really interesting presentation. And I would like to come back to this issue: ideological problems, ideological yeah. resistances yeah. to. Um, raising domestic pigs. And, and, and I would like to do that by referring to the chronological end point of your story, which you nev never um, referred to, and unjustifiable reasons in your presentation. I I'm curious about your way of thinking why domesticated pigs disappeared. I mean, it's the easy answer is Islam. I'm asking this as a, as a historian of um, Islam and Middle East. Uh, and, and that sounds to me you know, um, too easy of an uh, uh, answer. I really would like you to kind of, you know, um, give us some clues about the ways in which the reasons for um, domesticated pigs disappeared in Anatolia, um, and 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 how may that have affected local communities or and 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 and, and the economies. Yeah, well, that's yeah. So that's an interesting question. Like, yeah, look at the at the, the broader the broader patterns. It's, it's, I mean, pigs are one of of many you know species. People have have food choices. Right, so there's a wide range of options out there of, of livestock to hunt or not to hunt and what to eat. Um, and I think when you look at it sort of very broadly from sort of a, a general kind of anthropological perspective, um, there's a lot of it's sort of very very coarsely like cultural filters being used to decide you know what to what to eat. I think you know in, in Julius Caesar in his in his uh, writings on the on the Gallic Wars talks about the Britons and how they're kind of weird because they don't eat hair. Um, and they don't. And he lists a couple of things that you know of, of things that the, that the ancient Britons didn't didn't eat that that mainland Europeans did. Um, and it's it's food choices. It's often sort of culturally oriented. Sometimes it has an economic. Sometimes it has a, an environmental component. But a lot of times, I think you see that it has to do with with, with status and it has to do with um, with identity and boundary formation. Uh, so when you talk about pigs in later periods in the Near East. What you find, what I find in Turkey in my own work, is that there is a, I mean, I would, you would almost call it, I would almost call it a, a taboo against pork, against pigs. I mean, I, I think what I see in the data, it is so strong in prehistory 
the rejection of pigs. I mean, they're, central Anatolia is this, this little you know, plateau that's literally surrounded by people who are raising pigs, and they absolutely reject them for almost 4,000 years. We actually don't know when the first pig management is incorporated back into that region, but by the Bronze Age, by 2000 BC, it's a normal part of, of life. Pigs are like 10% of the economy, like they are throughout the Near East, kind of a supplemental meat source that households can use um, for, uh, for, 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 again, for subsistence production. Um, but Brian Hess did some, and, and Paula Wapner, some archaeologists, um, have, have did some very interesting work looking broadly at, at Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, the archaeological record in the Iron Age for the origins of, of pig taboos um, in, in the southern Levant. And what they found was there were lots of places. There was lots of places, including in Anatolia, uh, in the Iron Age in the first and, and, and a little bit early in the second millennium, um, where pigs were, were, were off the table, were either rejected or, were, or had a, a very small percentage of the, of the economy. So it was actually a fairly widespread um, pattern of, uh, of, of strong cultural associations with, with pigs. Uh, and you can sort of understand, I think that's related partially to just to, to pigs themselves as creatures, right? They're not like sheep, they're not like goats, they're not like cattle, they're not, you know, eventually like, like chickens, they're weird. Um, they have different behaviors, they have different requirements. They're often, if you look at, you know, Bronze Age texts, the early texts in the, in the Middle East, they're often categorized as this sort of strange other creature that's often linked with dogs, they're often categorized with dogs as dirty animals. So they often have a, a negative sort of uh, ritual connotation, like don't let the pigs or dogs into the temple areas or everything is messed up. Um, so there's, there's a really widespread um, sort of, in some cases negative, not, it's not necessarily all, all related, but like uh, negative association with pigs that gets picked up by specific communities in different places. I mean, some, some areas in, in, in sort of early classical Anatolia are known for, for pig production and others are known for totally hating pigs and, and keeping them outside of their, their settlements, having strong urban rules about keeping pigs away. So I think it's, it, it frequently comes up, it's a pretty obvious mechanism that communities are using um, for, again, for the, the reasons are probably very much community and, and chronologically specific, um, you know, for, for creating ethnic boundaries, for creating difference, uh, or for taking advantage of an economic opportunity. Or in some cases, it's just too hard to manage pigs because they suck up too much water and they, you know, maybe they, they pollute the water sources or, or, or create problems. So there's, there's a whole bunch of different answers that I think, I think it, it, it's just, and it shows up again and again, partially just because of the nature of pigs, like the nature of their, of their difference from other, uh, other livestock. Like they're, they're, a good, they're a good target for sort of symbolic um, manipulation. Maybe we'll hold questions here and we'll have some more time for Q&A after the, the next speaker. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank um, Gabe and Olga for inviting me along to this conference. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a very long way for me to come, all the way from Australia, 27 hours. A bit tired, but overall pretty good. Um, look, um, Gregor and, and, um, and uh, Ben have already given up really interesting stories on their perspectives. I'm going to give a different, slightly different story, which um, sort of complements what they're talking about. I'm not actually going to talk about domestication per se itself. I'm going to talk about a little bit further along the line and um, the movements of domestic pigs into um, island Southeast Asia. So I'm going to talk a little bit, first of all, about the understanding we have of the origins and roots of translocation of mod uh, uh, through the modern and genetic um, data for pigs into island Southeast Asia. I'm going to link that ge um, genetic evidence for pig translocations to zoo archaeological records, so we can, so I can show you how we get this time depth, um, and we build up this time depth for these translocations that we see within the in the um, modern DNA records. And then I'm going to uh, go to a couple of case studies. Um, I'm going to look at ne Neolithic pigs and economies and new modes of settlement. So, how are pigs being introduced to island Southeast Asia or mainland in island Southeast Asia? Um, who's introducing them, um, and what, for what reasons, shall we say, um, and how are, they, how are they embedded into those economies. And then in my final case study, I'm going to look at a little bit, I'm going to move to the Philippines from, from the mainland, and we're going to look at um, a little bit of social archaeology, and maybe some of the reasons beyond sort of the, the obvious food resource um, uh, econo economic basis for, for introduction of pigs towards more of a sort of social and ideological 
um, perspective and how we actually try and get at that in the archaeological record. So first of all, um, as I say, domestic pigs, uh, pigs were domesticated in China 8,000 plus years ago, and they were moved from China, <coughs> central, central China, Yellow, Yellow River, the Yangtze River area, they moved through to China, down into southern China, and then into the northern fringes of what we call Southeast Asia here. So if we look at, look at my point right, Southeast Asia, we're talking about northern Vietnam here, mainland Southeast Asia, Thailand, Cambodia. Here's island Southeast Asia here, with Borneo, the Philippines, Sumatra, New Guinea, out, out through here into Melanesia, and then out into the Pacific. So one of, one of um, uh, the interesting sort of uh, genetic haplotypes we've got is what, what we call the Pacific clade, or what Gregor and his team call the Pacific clade here. Now this is not a pig domestication here. As Gregor has said before, um, in, in the earlier talk, what's probably happened is domestic pigs have been moved into northern island, uh, northern mainland Southeast Asia, and they've ab there's been admixture and introgression, and they picked up this, this genetic marker here called the Pacific clade, which is really very useful. We can then track that, track that, sorry, track that across mainland Southeast Asia, island Southeast Asia. And in the modern genetics, they were able to follow it down through Sumatra. Um, Java and, and hypothesize a route out through into around New Guinea, into New Guinea, out through the small Solomon Islands, and this clade of pigs is found all the way out through to Hawaii, right, right across through the Pacific. It was moved over vast dif different distances, and we know that also from the archaeological record. But I'm going to stick with um, our main London Island Southeast Asia story in a moment. The second interesting um, Hapla group of pigs is what's called the Lan Yu pigs. The Lan Yu, Lan Yu is a small island here between Taiwan and the Philippines. Um, and we don't really, still don't know, it's quite enigmatic, we still don't really know the story of this, uh, this um, Hapla type of pig. Um, but what we do know is its distribution is just from Taiwan around in the Philippines and it doesn't seem to have been moved anywhere else. Okay? But it probably originates maybe on mainland, um, and then again it's picked up this, this signature somewhere in the area where it's found. So that's a story, so we say with a modern, modern story. Now we can link that to the archaeological record. So here I've got a number of archaeological sites um, where we've actually found um, uh, pig remains um, within the Neolithic period, and we can actually Look at, look at the early introduction. So we can then link the genetics to the early introduction. So man back here, domesticated pigs, we've got from 3,700 cow BP. There's no domesticated pigs in mainland or island Southeast Asia before 4,500 BP. Right? They're all introduced after that date. Then if we look at Ban Nong Wat in Thailand, we've got domesticated pigs there at 3,700 BP, and we know that this is Pacific clade signature there. We go to An Shun and Lok Giang and Rak Nui in southern Vietnam, and I'm going to come back to these, these sites as one of my case studies in the moment. Earlier states around 4,000. We've also linked that to the Pacific clade. Then if we go down to Liang Bua, which is a cave site in Flores, we've got Pacific clade there from around 3,500. In Mananga Sapaco, Kamasi, Pacific clade there from possibly 3,500 BP. And then out to Watam Di, which is a site in, in the Moluccas, 3,200 BP. So we can trace it across the island Southeast Asia, from the mainland across the island Southeast Asia. And that makes a nice link between the modern genetics and the ancient genetics and the archaeological record. So we have dates for these, for these um, translocations across. And then it goes out into the Pacific. It's found on Vanuatu before 3,000 years ago, and then out. The other clade, um, the Lanyu clade, we've got Lanyu pigs at a place called Savadug, around 3,200. And this is, these are islands called the Patanis Islands, just south of Lanyu. And then Nagsabran, which I'm going to talk about in my case study here as well. We've got a direct date on pigs there of 4,499, 4,332 Cal BP, right? And I'll come back to that a little bit um, in a second. So, domestic pigs, settlements and economy. So I'm going to focus on some work that I've been doing in southern Vietnam um, at, the, at the sites of the, here, they're down in the Mekong Delta region of southern Vietnam here. They're all quite close together, about 80 kilometers apart. And Shun and Lok Yang are about 300 meters apart, so they're very close together. Um, Rak Nui is closer to the coast. It was occupied slightly later, as we'll see in, see in, a, in a minute. Um, all these sites are along major um, river, river channels. Um, 
And that's no coincidence, um, as, I'll, as I'll come to as I go through here, go through, the, through this part of the talk. So first of all, I've, I'm just going to touch on a little bit on, on Anshun and Lokjiang, um, and then I'll talk a little bit uh, uh, more in, uh, um, extensively on, on the site of Rak Nui. So the earliest domestic pigs are from, from these two sites very close together, at Anshun and Lokjiang, around 4,000 years ago. These sites are they're new to the region. These sites appear around about this, this, um, uh, this time, around 4,000 years ago. They've got no predecessors. They just appear in the, in the environment along these, river, along these um, major tributaries of the Mekong. So it suggests that people are actually moving into the region. Right? And with them, with them, they're coming their domestic pigs. Right? They've also got dogs as well, as we'll see. Um, so we... On, the, on these early, early sites, we identified, originally identified these domestic animals by age profiling. So this, this mandible here I'm showing here is a young pig. We know it's a young pig because it's still got some of the deciduous teeth in it. So we can identify, as Ben was mentioning, we can identify this as, as young pigs. pigs. There's a majority of young pigs in, in the assemblage. And we can say with an, a, a degree of confidence that these are likely to be domestic pigs, managed pigs. In the past, like at the present, in your pig management, you, you, um, you'll, you'll find that you don't need to keep pigs very long. Right? Unless you're going to breed with them, you slaughter them at a young age. There's no point keeping them to adulthood, right? unless you're going to keep them for breeding. Then we've got the ADNA on it. The ADNA specifically, that supports our, our, our understanding that they're, they're domestic pigs. Um, the settlement of Raknui is slightly later. Um, it, as we see, it dates to around 3,500. It's a mounded site. Um, these, these sites go up to about five meters deep. There's me stood in the bottom of the hole there when we've just finished excavating this trench. So here's, the, here's, the mound, here's the, what's left of the mound itself. Like a lot of these sites in Vietnam, they've built a whopping great big pagoda on it because it stands out and they like to stick their pagodas on things that stand out in the landscape. Um, it's a common religious, religious um, process. Um, and then we've got some previous excavation trenches. We dug trench one here, eight meters by four meters, trench two, which are the two trenches I shall talk about mostly. Then we've got trench three here, and we dug a little sort of trial trench over the side here. We wanted to investigate the nature of the archaeological record here to understand the development of the site, the settlement patterns, how, the, how, how it was constructed, um, the economy of these people that had actually moved into this site. So this five meters of deposit, um, we found over 13 phases of, reconstru of reconstructed, um, shall we say, structures on the site. Um, what the image here shows is one of the earlier structures. This is one of the drawing of, of this. You can just see that from the photograph, the outlines, you see these fine dark lines here. These are actually these, these sort of um, fence lines. This area is raised slightly in the middle, like a, a small platform, and then there's post holes, fences around the outside. Inside, you can see the light color here. This is actually remnant surface. This has been deliberately laid, and our hypothesis at the moment is they're using shell lime mortar. So they're producing shell lime mortar. They're producing these floors on these on these slightly raised platforms, and then they're constructing their their, their buildings and structures on there. When we had first excavated this site, five meters deep, we thought, well, they must have been doing this for a very, very long time, building all these structures. And when we got the dates back, to our astonishment, all five meters had gone up in less than 300 years. So they've been reconstructing, reconstructing uh, at quite a rapid rate. So if we, look at the pro if we look at it in profile, this is what I'm talking about. So the, one I, the, the, the floor surface I was showing you just now is one of these phase one, phase twos. But you see phase three, four, five, six. So what they're doing is they're building, they're then constructing their, their, their structures, houses, then they're knocking the whole thing down and they're rebuilding on top again. And it's going up and up and up, right? So they're slowly raising the ground surface. And you can see even these big post holes, these are big supporting posts, they're rebuilding them over and over again. And they're doing exactly the same thing, time and time again, as they're re reconstructing the building. This whole lot, as I say, 300 years, which was quite astonishing. So they're re they must be knocking these structures down and rebuilding them every 10 to 15 years. So not only do we have these um, uh, 
structures, these little raised platform structures that I was talking about in trench one, which is this one here. In trench two, the L shape on the end here, we also have these nice um, rectangular little structures here. This is in the process of being excavated. These are all aligned with the other platforms. So the, this, this settlement, what this is actually telling us is this settlement's actually planned, it's laid out, right? It's designed from, it, from, it, from, it, from its inception. The people who built these settlements knew what they were actually doing when they, when they set out to, to build these platforms in the first place. Because of the amount of investment being, being put into actually the construction of, these, of this settlement, it's likely to be permanent or at least semi-permanent. You don't bother to make shell line mortar floors if you're gonna leave next week, right? So they're actually staying there. They're there on a, on a fairly permanent basis. Nobody's lived in this area before. Um, it, the sea level had dropped pretty recently and they moved into this area. So really these are pioneer settlers. They're moving into this area, they're coming in. What are they actually doing economically? <coughs> this is um, what we zoo archeologists do for a living. We set ourselves out, we look at all the animal bones, we identify all the animal bones, and we actually try and identify how many, how much of each species we've got. Don't worry about minimum numbers of individuals and NISPs, that's what we zoo archaeologists do. Um, we're, um, what's important is you look at pigs down here, domestic pigs, there's quite a lot of domestic pigs, but if you look at what else is there, um, in terms of mammals, mammals, reptiles and birds, you can see there's lots of reptiles, um, lots of turtles, people like to eat turtles, people like to eat monitor lizards, and even the saltwater crocodiles, there's a lot of saltwater crocodile bones, and a lot of them are butchered, and they're certainly eating those, probably taking the skins, whatever. Monkeys, wherever, all these early sites, we get monkeys. Domestic dogs, there's quite a lot of domestic dogs there, so they're introducing dogs and pigs are coming with them. And the dogs are also butchered. Every single site I look on in the Neolithic across Ireland, Southeast Asia, and mainland Southeast Asia, has got lots of butchered dog bones. Um, so pigs are actually integrated into what you can see here, into, a, into a, quite a diverse economy. Right? And there's lots of other different taxa being introduced as well. So if we look at this overall, we've got this new settlement, pioneer settlement. These people are coming in, they're building their settlements. Right? And, then, and then they're actually bringing pigs and, pigs and dogs with them. We also know they've got rice with them, but not very much. And also my, my botanical people, the botanical people that work with us are saying that this rice looks like, they, they can tell from the types of um, materials that they're actually finding, they can tell that the rice that's coming in is actually being brought in um, rather than being grown locally. And this is, this is still estuarine there, it's very saline, it wouldn't have been good for rice. So the rice is coming in. So they've, they, they've, got the domestic, they've got the domestic pigs, but as you can see, there's a huge reliance on other resources, particularly aquatic resources. Hundreds of thousands of fish bones. So they're catching an awful lot of fish. They're using a lot of different trapping techniques. So the, the domestic animals are not really, the, at this stage, maybe not really the major economic um, uh, factor within, within, the, within their resources. This might well be because at this stage, these are pioneer people, they're moving in to these new areas and they're still extremely heavily reliant on other resources, particularly until they get established. Right? <coughs> so this is really, really interesting. We're seeing the early stages of these people, these, these new sort of agriculturalists that are moving into the region, bringing, we're bringing these resources with them. Now I'm going to move beyond, on, from, on from there onto, onto the second case study, um, pigs in a social context. And I'm going to move from Vietnam into, into the Philippines. Now, um, Gabe was on about, yesterday was on about his sort of swinology, and I've got a swinology fact here today for us. Um, the Philippine archipelago, I don't know if you know, actually has more species of pig than anywhere else in the world. That's Zeus, Zeus species, Zeus Swofa, or Eurasian wild boar. The Philippines actually has six species of pig. Right? In the north, up here, we've got Zeus philippinensis. In the central region is Zeus zebifrons. Here in Mendor Mindoro is Zeus oliveri. Here in Palawan, Zeus hohoan abavis. And then down here in the south here is Zeus barbatos. And right across the entire island is the introduced domestic pig, Zeus grofa. Amazing, there we go a swinology fact for us this morning. Okay? <laughs> <coughs> now to get back to what I've got in my story, um, I'm talking about a site here called Nagsaburan. 
Um, it's up here, again, it's along one of these major major river channels. Um, all these Neolithic sites of this date are along these major river, river channels. Um, primarily, it's a shell midden, and it's a big shell. This is all shell, meters of shell. Right? And people are living on top of these shells, they're building their houses on top of these shells. This is a human burial in the bottom here as well. So this is an excavation. This part, part I'm talking about, his excavation took place in 2009. Um, the, shell midden, the shell midden itself um, is a little bit later. It dates from about 2,500 to 1,600 BP. But the early phases are, are underneath, and underneath this burial here, and that dates from about 4,000 to 3,000 BP. Um, along with the shell midden, shell midden's thinner here, towards the edge of the site, lots of post holes. So as they're, they're constructing, they're constructing their settlements um, on, the, on this site. And within the shell midden and within the clay layers underneath, the layer, myth, Neolithic layers, we get lots of animal bone. This is a big pig mandible. Um, and we've got lots of animal bones mixed in with the shell. And the hypothesis here is that they're actually constructing their houses above ground level, stilted. It's very common in the Philippines to do this. And they're chucking the bones over the edge um, of, of, of the structures. They're getting incorporated into the, into the shell. And that's why you get this really nice, well-preserved um, animal bone, um, pig mandibles animal bone. Um, lots of dog gnawing. We also got dog burials as well. So they've got dogs, dogs there as well as pigs. Yep. Um, and basically, if we look at the um, fauna here, we've got, we've got some fish, we've got some um, deer, um, introduced buffalo a little bit later on. Um, pigs dominate, dominate a lot. But if we then look at the pigs themselves, right, um, we've got two different species. We've got the endemic wild pig and we've got introduced domestic pigs. Um, in this case, it's really quite easy to tell the difference between um, the Philippine wild boar here. These are really diminutive, they're small pigs, and this is introduced um, domestic pigs. So this, pig, this tooth here, these are both the same teeth, the um, upper third molar, this is the endemic wild boar, this is domestic pig here. Because it's quite straightforward to, to differentiate between them, we can look at how many of each of these species are actually in the archaeological record. So if we, do, if we do that, we can measure, so these are straightforward bimodal plots looking at length versus width, and then we've got modern, modern specimen, specimens as a scrofa, a circular, um, and modern specimens are just Philippinensis as squares, and then all the crosses are actually the, the archaeological specimens. And you can see they divide up very nicely, very nicely indeed. So we can identify the endemic wild boar from the, the um, introduced domestic Suscrofa. So what does this allow us to do? Well, one, we can be very confident that the, the, the pig tooth that we dated is a domestic pig, because we can separate it from the wild pigs very easily. What we can also do is look at the wild pigs and domestic pigs in terms of numbers. What are we actually seeing in terms of, are there more wild pigs or more domestic pigs? But when, when we look at it, as you can see, especially in this graph here, you can see there's a lot more wild pig than there is domestic pig. In fact, we have a ratio of wild pig to domestic pig to four to one. Right? That's interesting. It seems to suggest that they're actually they're actually um, hunting more wild pig than they are. More wild pig are getting in, are being introduced through um, from food resources rather than, than the domestic pigs. So what does this actually mean? Well, with the ethnographic parallels to this, the Ifugao in northern Luzon they keep native black pigs specific for, specifically for ceremonial and ritual purposes, and they differentiate these from general eating pigs. Um, and and I suspect that the possibility is that we're also seeing this in the past. Pigs are not only just being introduced as an economic resource, but there's, there's something else going on there. There's, there's something in terms of the way they look at these new resources that they're bringing in or they've been brought in, and the way they're actually using and utilizing those, these resources. So I've done a quick sort of whistle-stop tour, so, so to speak, of, of, of zoo archaeology in Southeast Asia, but I've tried to pick out some points, one, one how we actually follow domestication, how we how we've been able to see how animals have been translocated across. I've looked at sort of human settlements, settlement patterns, you know, the, the resources, the, the importance of domestic pigs within these early early economies. And then I've tried to look at a little bit more about the sort of social um, archaeology and how and why pigs beyond their economic function, why they may well have also been introduced to places like Ireland, Southeast Asia. Thank you.
think we have time for maybe one question for Dr. Piper, and um, maybe in the process, the rest of the panelists could come up so that we can have questions to the whole panel. You get middle. <laughs> I have a question that's sort of inspired by Philip's comments, and but really for the whole panel, and that is. Um, uh, I'll, let me give you a preface, which is that, that I only pretend I work on pigs, but I'm really an Africanist. And, and um, not that they don't have pigs in Africa, but they're not domesticated and raised in, to the same extent. And um, in, I want to say in the late 1960s, there's an anthropologist um, named Claude Mayas who came up with a um, uh, totally speculative theory that cattle domestication was primarily facilitated and intended for the purpose of promoting bride, well, um, and it, as I said, totally speculative, not based on any archaeological evidence, but there's pretty good evidence, pretty good ethnographic evidence that cattle don't form much of an economic resource uh, in terms of food, con in terms of consumption. Um, pastoralists tend not to eat beef, uh, except on extremely rare occasions. And once you get past mis mixed pastoralism and agriculture, you don't even get much dairy consumption, except in for for elites. So, but nonetheless, cattle are vital to. Um, to social economies in all sorts of ways. And so that leads me to the question that's, I think, begged by Philip's um, example in the end, which is, which is what are pigs for? Um, and I think it also goes to, uh, in Ben's presentation, there's an assumption I think that we all make, which is that when um, communities refused to domesticate pigs, then we look for ideological meanings to, those, to that refusal but we don't ask the same question when they do domesticate. It seems as though it's just a self-evident practical purpose. But the evidence that you presented suggested, for example, that pigs were imported into Cyprus for purposes that were uh, not, I mean, there was a great effort made to bring pigs with you but not consume them for meat, so but clearly they were useful in some way. There was, a, there was some point to having them there. And also the, the sort of the nature of the monumental um, uh, architecture and our monumental visual features that you that you that are found all across yeah. Western um, uh, Anatolia suggest as well that that there is an ideologically rich purpose in 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 pigs that certainly goes is it's not limited to or reducible to to just the fact that they're that they're kind of tasty. Um, <laughs> so so what I want to know about um, is is social organization and what what can we say about the forms of social just as in, in, in the African. Africanist example that when you think about bridewells and clanship and 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 forms of lineal descent and the ways that that produces um, patriarchy, the ways that that produces um, clan in, in clan relationships and and, and, and transaction, how, what kinds of social organization can we talk about in these in this sort of swath of Asia that would facilitate or promote the um, relationships with pigs, either either refusing to have them or and or promoting their, their uh, access to access to pigs. So that's my question. Do you want to take it? Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's a whopper, uh, <laughs> right? Um, <clears throat> I, I really like the, the, the way you are sort of flipping the, um, the, the conversation to, to talk about um, the, <laughs> why pigs. What's the, what's the function? Because um, you're absolutely right, archaeologists certainly assume right from hindsight like from our our world where you know m most of us are are agriculturalists who rely on on livestock it's like how how could you live without this it is an obvious subsistence economy sort of focus that is 100% the perspective the biased perspective that we take back to 10,000 BC to the archaeological record um, and it's created a narrative in which you're trying to explain the obvious, like it's the, the obvious logical choice. Um, we always sort of think of hunter-gatherers as these sort of pitiful, starving people who you know haven't figured out the great idea. Gregor, you 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 mentioned the uh, the the idea that it's it's in critique the fact that it's it's often seen as a intentional process of this sort of genius prehistoric person who was like, I'm going to take that dog or that aurochs or that boar and turn it into this economically wonderful thing, which is obviously total nonsense. And it's a, just we're projecting ourselves back. Um, but that's that's what you see in the literature. It's it's and it's kind of it's, you know, based in sort of cultural ecology. It's based in some, you know, ecological models of increasing forager efficiency if you if you control and manage your resources. But but I, I think the, the most interesting question to ask 
these days is sort of why are you domesticating? And if you look at the evidence, um, I think it's not for food. I think you're, you're absolutely right. I think the African example with, with cattle is probably sort of the best and, and sort of biggest example of an entire sort of way of life focused on an animal and it's not about eating the animal. It's about the social uses of animals. And so I, I absolutely think that that perspective needs to be projected back to the past. And, and I think you can probably, it, it's, hard to, like, hypo, it's hard to create a, a testable hypothesis about that. Um, but I think, I think I mean, you, can, so you can come up with something uh, sure to, to do that. <laughs> it's like the, the wheels are turning there. Um, <laughs> But, but I think the domestication of animals is, is totally about manipulating human social relationships. It's not about getting enough calories. I mean, these hunter-gatherers, they could get enough calories. I mean, these are, these are genius ecologists. I mean, they know how to get enough food. And when you look at the archaeological record, I think there's absolutely no evidence for, uh, for, for any shortage in, 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 in game. Like, this is the usual argument. Domestication happened because hunters settled down and they ate all the food. And so they had to manage their resources. If you look in, in the southern Levant in Israel, in the Jordan Valley, that sort of looks like it works. But elsewhere, Iran, Turkey, Lebanon, everywhere else, it's nonsense. There's no support for that at all. So it's, it's social reasons. It's social reasons that people are, um, are, are, are keeping these animals ready. And I think the, uh, Phil's example of the, sort of the ritual use of certain pigs for certain particular purposes is, is exactly right. That's what's happening. Um, there are really strong cultural associations with these animals. I mean, hunting hunting societies have. I mean, you know, uh, often these animals are 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 persons, right? They're non-human persons that are connected to a much, I mean, a totally complicated, you know, connected worldview. Um, and so, what does it mean that you're bringing a non-human person, right? Perhaps into your into your community. Why do you have it there? Why do you need to have it handy? For a purpose, um, and so I think the the I mean we, we I mean try to find a, a zooarchaeologist working in prehistory who it, it's actually really hard to get those stories published, because when I try to talk about that, the science oriented sort of ecologically oriented archaeologists are like this is nonsense. Like where's the you know where's the where's the model testing? Where's the optimal foraging theory application? So it's hard to figure out, at least for me, um, how to how to address the question of how do you put social organization into the story of, of domestication. Um, and you can use some analogy, right? I mean, so that's, that's sort of what we're, we're, we're left with. But I mean, um, but, but I mean, just the, the broad answer, I think, is that's, that's exactly the, the reasoning. The, the trick is looking back to prehistory and trying to, to figure out the mechanisms that, uh, that brought people and animals together. But I certainly don't think it was for food. It was, it was for just, just those bride wealth and, no, and things just, like just that. Just to follow up on that, I think you're absolutely right. And I, the, the interesting thing for me is very much echoing what Ben was saying about how we tend to project our current scenario onto the past and then say, well, how do we get there? And one thing that I was trying to emphasize in my talk was that the sort of accidental nature of history, that you, there is, it's all short-termism, it's all using something for a specific purpose, and then there's, an, there's a byproduct that then gets the attention and when that byproduct gets the attention, the origins of it in retrospect get really confused. And there's a really great example with glass. So you don't, Bill Bryson's got this great quote about how you could stand him on the edge of a beach and you know it would take him forever to look at it and say, oh, if I mix the sand with a little bit of potash, I could invent windows. You just, you don't, because in retrospect, you can't possibly <laughs> see how that would work. And when you look at the origins of glass, what happens is that people are doing, um, making glazes and the, the process of making a glaze releases uh, these kind of like shiny little bits that are an accidental byproduct of that process. And then when you start focusing then all of your efforts on the byproduct, you can then say, oh wow, that's kind of shiny and interesting, but it was an accidental kind of flame off of making the glaze. And then you start creating the glass. And so it's in the same way that people early domesticated animals, and this is exactly what Ben was saying, when you look at the chickens, nobody's eating chickens for thousands of years. People have chickens, but there's no archaeological evidence that they're being eaten. There's cockfighting well before you've got evidence for eating chickens. You've got ritual practices with chickens for a very long time being buried in specific pots as part of uh, funerary things. But it, it makes no sense to eat a chicken on a large scale because there's so little meat on the bones. We think of a chicken as now, chickens are like five times bigger now than they were 10, 20 years ago. So you, even you know a thousand years ago, God forbid, it would just take way too much effort to try and get a meat off a chicken bone. It just makes no sense. And 
you, you have chickens in the early Iron Age in the UK, but for a very long time, all the way up through the Romans, nobody's eating them. And that's very clear. And I think that as we start shifting that focus around, rather than saying, well, we eat them now, so we must have eaten them then, I can't think of a single animal, actually, that the early archaeological evidence suggests that they are being consumed in the way that we think of it now. And so if you start as the eating is only the accidental byproduct of focusing on like we do with glass, with the faience when you're making the glazes, early domestic animals, it's not about food. It's about lots and lots of other things. And it's this whole kind of ritual element and religious element. And as and when you look at Gobekli Tepe, it's amazing. Like the way in which they're building these giant monuments. These are hunter-gatherers on the plane still taking enough time to do us. I mean, they had plenty of time. I don't mean to imply that they didn't. But just being able to organize to get these massive stones together and put all these different animals from boar to snakes to mm -hmm. cattle to all kinds of stuff on there. So animals are being integrated into human societies in a way that has nothing whatsoever to do with production for food. And that's only a much later thing. And when we, we make a really big mistake when we then apply that onto the past. That's a, it's a really great point. Yeah, I was just trying to, I showed that example for, exact, for exactly that reason. And in, as Ben says, it's very hard for archaeologists to get to this, and, and, and it's even harder for us to publish this, this, this sort of... That's um, <laughs> these, sort of these sort of ideological social, social perspectives behind sort of the use of domesticated animals. So um, uh, the chicken's a really good example in, in, in Southeast Asia, in island Southeast Asia, um, particularly where cockfighting is absolutely huge and it's still huge. In the Philippines, they've got an entire TV channel dedicated to cockfighting. I mean, it's just massive. So what came first, the, the, the chicken, the, the cocks for cockfighting or, or chickens to eat? Well, I, I think I would agree with Gregor. There's a, there's a, there's a, uh, it seems to me that, that uh, cockfighting is probably, uh, it's been there a very, very long time. And, um, uh, and that could well have been the reason why. Also, we see um, domestic ch domesticated chickens are, are quite rare in the archaeological record. And that, again, could be quite, certainly the Neolithic archaeological record. And that could also be one of the reasons why they're quite rare is because they're not actually an economic resource in the early days at all. They're being used for other, other, other reasons, such as, such as, as cockfighting. Um, also, we've got to remember that We've been talking about domestication here in terms of, in terms of the, the animal human animal interactions. Um, that that domestication and the agricultural process as a whole, and that shift to sedentary lifestyles, to the managing animals, that was a huge human psychological shift. And we see all kinds of weird things going on. Um, I think Ben might be able to clarify a bit more on in, in, the, in that region there, like Chatelhoyuk, and you start to get all these sort of weird. Um, statues of animals and all kinds of things, and it's all to do with this sort of people are people are, are, are behaving in the environment very differently to what they've done throughout prehistory before that time, and it's and that psychological shift is 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 clearly like there's there's, there's a conflict going on in their minds, and they're trying to I don't know, trying to accept it to a certain extent about how they how they're manipulating they're starting to manipulate the environment in a way that they've never done before. Um, and 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 that's part of, part part of this process is also with with the with the way that they're, they're having the relationships with with animals and how those relationships are changing. Take one more question, and then I think we'll wrap wrap up. Uh, this is a question for Philip. Uh, the uh, as if I'm not mistaken, around 5000 BC, you have a migration of Austronesian populations from Taiwan to Southeast Asia. Uh, it would astound me if they didn't bring their pigs with them. Uh, and at least according to some uh, kind of theories, they found the they were, uh, I gather, a cultivating people beforehand. And when they got to Southeast Asia, they found uh, the environment so rich that they basically gave up um, uh, cultivation and became uh, foragers, hunters, uh, and so on. And so why? What prevented, why did, if they didn't bring their pigs, why not? If they did bring their pigs, why didn't they then mix uh, with the pigs of the Pacific plate or whatever? You, uh, Pacific why plate. don't we, <laughs> given that migration, why don't we have a, a mixture of the different uh, um, uh, species of pigs? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start here, and then Gre yeah, Gregor sure, will follow sure, on. Sure. Um, I, I, in this in this um, uh, presentation today, I, I deliberately avoided going into the um, whole Austronesian-speaking 
people's migration across Ireland and Southeast Asia, because that's a big story in its own right, and um, I could have taken up my whole talk talk with that. So I, I kept very much with the um, what we know about the, the um, translocation of domesticated animals across into, into Ireland, Southeast Asia, from mainland Southeast Asia, um, 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 specifically with the pigs. Um, there's, the, sto the story is ongoing here, um, and, it's, and it is interesting because um, they didn't take the pigs from, um, from the Philippines across at all, and that's very clear. Um, there's new um, human genetics come out from Vanuatu now, um, and the archaeological records seems to be fairly clear that it was the Philippines where people came from to go out through out to um, out to Polynesia. They do have their they do seem to have their origins from that that region of of island Southeast Asia. But um, the movement of domestic animals seems to have been extremely complex all across the, across the region, um, and pigs were not one one of the things that actually went with those individuals from the Philippines. Do you want to? Yeah, I think that's. It's, that belies uh, the same kind of thing we were just talking about, where we take in the present, we then take that thing and put it in the past, and use this word package all the time. I mean, Ben's, when we, you know, cutting our teeth in the, in the field, it's all the Neolithic package, or the Austronesian package, and it consists of a certain number of animals and plants and cultural potteries and whatever else. And that's when we see that come together as a whole, we then assume it was moving as a single unit from a point of source, and then we just try and track it all the way through. But in the same way that we can't imagine that people who had first domestic animals were necessarily eating them, and that wasn't the purpose necessarily, in exactly the same way, these packages didn't exist either. And uh, the evidence, certainly from Anatolia, is that the way in which these different animals, we think of, I mean, we even, I make the same mistake all the time, we throw cows, sheep, goat, and pigs all into the same economic unit and call that, that's what's happening in Anatolia. But really, when you start getting to the nitty gritty of it, you realize that the cows, the pigs, and the sheep, they're all slightly different. And they all are coming together in different ways and in different places. And for the Austronesian perspective, it really certainly looks like the dogs, the pigs, the chickens, the pottery, the rice, everything's got its own individual story. And you only recognize it after it's come together by the time it gets past as sort of the, the fine line between near and remote Oceania, at which point we recognize it as a thing and then try and track it all the way back before that. And that's absolutely not the case. What's really interesting, and this is the paper that Phil and I are working on together right now, is that the there is this lanyu pig that's clearly being traded or moved back and forth between Taiwan, the Batanes, and at least northern Philippines, possibly down a little bit further south. But the pig that's in the Pacific has nothing whatsoever to do with that, and that's coming through a completely separate trajectory. Now, what the people are doing is whether they're coming from different sources and then amalgamating and, and admixing in different ways, and then you finally end up with a position where you've got a pig from over here, a chicken from over here, which may have come across a completely different route. You've got some really cool evidence about that. And so once we start breaking the package up into its individual units, the story gets a hell of a lot more complex, a hell of a lot more interesting, and a hell of a lot more satisfying because that's the way that life works. It's not just like these monolithic things that are just happening through space and time. So, for example, in southern, southern Vietnam, I've got, they've, got, they've got pigs and dogs, but as far as I can tell at the moment, there's no cattle. Whereas in Thailand, at the same sort of period of time, they've got cattle. And in the Neolithic, there. So there's there's different trajectories coming, and that these animals are coming in from, as Gregor says, from different places. There there is no package, so to speak. I think in the interest of time, we'll um, and and in the interest of replenishing our caffeine levels, we'll, we'll cut it here for now. Please join me in thanking That's our good. panelists for a great start to our day of swinology. Thank you.